Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the House of Kayfabe. Tis I, Brian Resner, with Stephen P. New. And Stephen P. New is with us today because we are doing part deuce. Um, no pun intended. It is, uh, it is the second installment of the Vince McMahon debacle. And there are new things that are out since we did our first video, Stephen. Yes, there are, and more people starting to talk. And one of the things that we'll focus on tonight, Brian, is who's talking, who's saying what, and then we'll focus on uh, something that is of interest to me, and that is the criminal that's currently going on and the criminal that may be yet to come. Well, I know that I have a question that I'm going to start with, and I'm sure I will not get an answer to this directly, but I am under the assumption that Brock Lesnar, how, however not completely innocent, is a complete casualty of this situation because after reading that document several times in several different ways and having you read that document to me several different times in several different ways, I can only see the only thing that he is guilty of is uh, liking piss porn and asking for it. And now he's lost everything. Well, actually, he gets to go home and, you know, chill out. We lost everything. We lost Brock versus Gunther. We lost Brock in the Royal Rumble. We lost Brock Lesnar, period. It looks like we're never going to see Brock Lesnar again because he asked a girl to piss on video. And that's super weird to me that that, that can happen. Um, I, I mean, if it comes out that Brock had a bigger to do with this than this document reads, then okay, I I give up on that. But as of right now, he sent a shitty text message. That's it. I'm going to play uh, the other side of that, okay? And you have to put uh, former UFC champion, uh, what the complaint refers to as WWE superstar who was in contract negotiations. And we know that with the timing and the SummerSlam, and the renegotiation of the contract, we know that more likely than not, it's Brock Lesnar. Well, it's uh, not Ronda Rousey, and it sure ain't Cain Velasquez. Right, because the timing doesn't line up. So presumably, and and you know, you and I are reading between the the, the tea leaves here that uh, this is Brock Lesnar's. I'm going to play the other side of that. All right, Lesnar's flown to Connecticut to have dinner and uh, renegotiate or negotiate a contract with McMahon. Reportedly gets too intoxicated to go and uh, meet Janelle Grant. Which that, could, wait, 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 let me pause you. Which could be an excuse saying, hey, I'm be, yeah, maybe, I'm, he I'm acted maybe he didn't want to do this. Maybe he was just playing along with Vince McMahon, sort of like the text message when the text message Brock said that he wasn't going to do it because if he did it, my tool would never fit it. All that stuff. That's just talk that, you know, maybe that you use to deflect. But in the context of what was going on with Janelle Grant, she's seeing yet again being pimped out by McMahon. And, and whether it was to Brock or to some other WWE superstar, that also happens to be the night that McMahon pretends to be presumably Brock Lesnar and viol violently sexually assaults Janelle Grant. And I would agree with you maybe if all Brock had done would have been, uh, you know, let's say that Janelle Grant just happens to be a girl in catering and he asks for the girl's phone number. She gives it to him. And then he texts her and says, why don't you send me a picture of you uh, taking a leak? Okay. In by itself, I can agree with you, but in the context of McMahon telling her he's forwarded pictures of her to referees and to guys in the truck and everybody else in the context of 
arranging a schedule for him, physical therapist, and Johnny Ace. In that context, I think Brock is not a quite casualty. as casualty as you th- no. Brock may not be as innocent as you think. A lot of this is going to turn on how much did Brock know about all of that other stuff. I mean, Brock may have just thought, "Hey, you know, here's some girl, uh, some hoe that Vince McMahon knows who will take porn pictures uh, for me." But reportedly, according to the lawsuit. For a number of weeks there, McMahon had sent him pictures of Janelle Grant and said, do you like what you see? And had told Janelle Grant he likes what he sees here. All of that in lead up to the dinner. So I think that we're going to have to agree to disagree. And it will be interesting to see uh, whether we get any direct text messages between Janelle Grant and anybody else that's referenced in the lawsuit or anybody else associated with WWE because those could be really, really damaging to any number of people, Brian. Oh, they absolutely could. But I I still come back to the only information we have to go by is this civil complaint. The only information anybody has to go by is the information in this civil complaint. And that's what starts the lawsuit and the next process is discovery. Okay, so now now after discovery, if we find out all types of things that Brock Lesnar is involved in, maybe see text messages, maybe find video, I I don't know what's going to happen at discovery. But right now, where we sit in this moment, when we are reading this civil complaint, Brock Lesnar is guilty of sending a text message asking for piss porn. True or false? That's what we know. What does WWE and TKO know? Okay, maybe they know more. Maybe everyone knows more. Maybe There's a reason why he was wiped from the WWE website. Well, it well sounds like they're wiping him completely like they're not mentioned. I mean, we're we are seeing (laughs) Right. We are seeing something similar to what happened to a guy who murdered his family. That's what's happening to Brock Lesnar right now. And if all he's guilty of is that, then I don't get it. But I guess you're right. Maybe there's some things that we are not privy to. But out of the information that we are privy to, I don't. I didn't want to lose Gunther versus Brock over piss porn. What the fuck is going on? Well, I didn't either. But if there is more and if there is fire where there is this smoke, I don't want to see Brock Lesnar in a WWE ring ever again. Well, you know what? If he did something heinous, I don't either. Okay? I am I can oh, I, you know, I, can I, I don't want to give him a chance to wrestle Gunther and, and tank Gunther that way. You know, that, that has a potential to, to, you know, stick around with, with Gunther. If, if Gunther wrestles him at WrestleMania this year and there is fire where there is this smoke, then that's going to hinder Gunther's career. And so, you know, WWE is probably playing it safe, pulling Lesnar out of this. It's one of two things. I, either they know that there's worse out there and they can't put him up in matches, or they don't know and they're afraid of what might be out there. And I could see WWE's lawyers uh, advising to remove Brock from the active roster and everything un- until more is known. Well, that's obviously what's happening. So um, hopefully there's something in Discovery that completely exonerates Brock Lesnar, but uh, I doubt it. I still would watch Gunther fight Brock Lesnar if they both did the most heinous things that you can possibly imagine. I would still watch them fight. You think the sponsors agree with you? No, they don't. <laughs> that's the problem. <laughs> Sponsors won't agree with you. Absolutely not. So let's talk about John Laranitis for a second. Sure. So nobody had that on their bingo card. John Laranitis is going to come out and say, I am not guilty, not because it didn't happen, but because I was a victim too. Wow. I, wouldn't you have loved to have been a fly on the wall when Vince McMahon read that? Sure. 
And I hope that Johnny Ace has the texts and the everything else to back that up. Uh, I heard Cornette comment on this part of it. And he said, uh, look, okay, assume that what Laurinaitis says is true. Then he goes for one of the arranged calendar dates, you know, that McMahon is supposedly exerting so much control over John Laurinaitis. He, he has, he's compelled to go and have sex with this younger woman in a hotel in Connecticut or New York or whatever, uh, flying in from a home in Arizona. And uh, he should meet the girl, they should have met the young lady and said, hey, look, I'm as big a victim as you are. So we're going to tell Vince that we did this. But in the meantime, <laughs> Corny said, read the Gideon's Bible. We're going to sit here uh, and we're going to watch Golden Girls reruns on Lifetime. And then, you know, the hour or two or whatever is going to go away. And I'm going to depart here. And you're going to tell Vince what a good time you had. And I'm going to tell Vince what a good time I had. And then we're not going to speak about this anymore. And I'm going to tell Vince, I'm really uncomfortable doing this. And I'm going to send him some emails and some texts so that I can prove that I don't really want to do this. And, uh, you know, if there were, the only way Laurinaitis succeeds on that bullcrap claim is if he literally has texts or emails saying, Vince, I don't like what you're asking me to do with this young lady. I'm really uncomfortable doing it. And McMahon responded, do it or you're fired. If Lauren is not going to be able to provide that, there's no well, way that he's going to be able to provide In the absence of that, in the absence of that, then he's just yet another WWE higher level executive taking advantage of Janelle Grant. And so, uh, you know what this reminds me of, this reminds me of the type of guy that gets caught cheating by his wife and automatically throws his best friend under the bus just because, just because, just, oh, I, it's, I got to deflect to someone. And then the best friend's completely blindsided by the fact that now the wife hates him, but they're still together. <laughs> but the way, you know what I mean? Right. It, it, it stinks of that type of, uh, of manhood. And Well, I, let me tell you something that I just found out today that makes all of this even worse. According to the timing, sources are saying that at the time that Laurinaitis was carrying on with all of this, that the Bella Twins' mother was sick with cancer. So your wife is in Arizona going through cancer treatment, and you're flying from Arizona to New York or Connecticut, and part of your extracurricular activity is this stuff in this complaint? Is, is this stuff in this complaint? And if she is a cancer survivor, Mrs. Garcia, whatever, Laurinaitis, uh, she may not have much time left. Imagine not having very long to live and that this is what you got to put up with. Yeah. That's, that's worse than what we had to put up with when he was actually on WWE television. Much, much worse, much, much, much worse. And if that turns out to be true, that his spouse was going through cancer treatments while he was carrying on all of this, it's pretty despicable. Okay. Something that, um, something you said kind of made me want to talk about another part of this that we didn't talk about in the first video. You said John Laronitis having this opportunity to have sex with a younger woman and you said the word younger and younger is kind of what we felt this entire time reading this complaint i thought we were talking about someone in their 20s i thought we were talking about i mean really the way that it talks about her living with her parents and her parents dying and all of this these things i'm picturing a 19 to 22 year old girl who was manipulated by this psycho billionaire with money and gifts, but she received her first text message from Vince McMahon when she was 40 years old. I think it was 38, but you're late thirties, early forties. Right. I think 
I think that you're probably right. So my question, my question here, and the reason why I said that is one, because no one's talking about the fact that this is a grown woman. But does that change anything, Steve? It, not to me. I don't think that it's going to matter to jurors once they. Well, you had mentioned in it. the first video that the text message that shows her reacting positively to these type of advances was going to hurt her in the court of law. I said that it could. I said that the word baby, when she responded to one of McMahon's texts, could be viewed as uh, a positive uh, or that she wasn't reacting in a bad way when she said, oh, baby, tell him that I'll do that next week or something along those lines. Now, I believe that I, that also came after the Brock Lesnar-esque sexual assault. So maybe she was trying to buy herself some time by responding to McMahon calling her baby with her calling him baby so that he wouldn't force that. But to your point, anybody at any age can be manipulated, Brian. Anybody at any age can find themselves uh, financially, emotionally, whatever, vulnerable. Now, you would. Th I, I have met 19-year-olds who are a whole lot more uh, worldly and experienced because life's been really hard on them from the age of 12 to 19 than some people in their 30s or late 30s who lived a sheltered life. Uh, you know, I don't know anything about Janelle Grant. Not much has come out. But uh, from the point that she meets McMahon forward, there was extreme manipulation and control and all of that thing all of those things i'm sure that janelle grant has been in intensive therapy since all of this and her treating health care providers her treating mental health providers are going to be a key part of this case if it moves forward through discovery so i'm going to get eaten up in the comments for even asking these questions but do you feel like now knowing that she was 40 years old, that the fact that there's only like one picture of her on, I think there's two pictures that I have seen of her. Both of them show her not 40 years old. Both of them, I think one of them, she's actually a teenager in, and the other one, she couldn't be more than 25 years old in. So those are the only two pictures online, and this was written the way it was written to lead you to believe that she was a lot younger than she is. Do you believe that those two facts make this somewhat disingenuous? No, I, I don't think so. Younger is a relative term. She's certainly younger than McMahon at 78. Sure. So even if she's 40 and she's half his age, that you're okay. So and yeah. younger than Laurenitis, uh, you know, by 20 years or whatever, Younger yeah. is a relative term. Sure is. It, it definitely is. So where do we go from here? And are we going to see this go criminal? In the civil case, where we go from here is through discovery. Like I said, I've done a lot of these cases. I do a lot of work in federal court. And so what's going to happen, Brian, is either Vince McMahon or John Laurinaitis or WWE are going to file motions to dismiss this case. They're going to, uh, I would be shocked if uh, any of the three defendants didn't file motions to dismiss the case. They have to, if, if, they, if they think that there's any flaw in the complaint whatsoever. I happen to think there are no flaws which would give rise to an early dismissal of this complaint. And even if certain things got knocked out uh, by the judge, and the judge said, for instance, well, that this trafficking law doesn't apply under the facts as you've pled them, da 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 da. Uh, I believe Janelle Grant's going to get into the next phase of this case, which is discovery. And discovery is where witnesses get deposed. You have up to seven and a half hours with each witness. So McMahon is going to be questioned 
for at least seven and a half hours. The plaintiff's lawyers can ask for more. Laurinaitis is going to be deposed at least seven and a half hours, maybe more. A corporate representative of WWE is going to be questioned at least seven and a half hours. There is going to be intensive document requests, uh, requests to admit certain things. There may even be a forensic examination of Laurinaitis and McMahon's cell phones, as well as these other witnesses that are mentioned, the, the employees of WWE and the higher ups. And so that process is step two in this lawsuit process. And it's a quest for the truth is what it is. You're, you're looking to place people under oath, under the penalty of perjury, to testify, to produce their documents, and for someone to say, hey, these are all of the documents that are known to exist. And then in the, the civil case, all of the knowledge, and it ties in with the Ashley Mazzaro stuff, uh, all of the times that WWE, as a corporation, knew that McMahon was doing things like this, uh, it may not be relevant to Janelle Grant's claims. Typically, that kind of character evidence is inadmissible and not relevant. But if what you're trying to prove is that the WWE knew that he was a sexual predator, that he did this to young ladies, and that the corporation has known for decades that McMahon did this kind of thing, that kind of evidence comes in. That's on the civil side what's going to happen. On the criminal side, we know that Wait, there's... Before you get to the criminal side, I have a question. Sure. So a question that I have for you is the text message screenshots that were provided in the civil complaint. When you put things like that into a civil complaint, is there a process of authentic, uh, like authentic authentication on that? Yes, yes. Authentication. Rule 901 of the Federal Rules of Evidence talks about how you authenticate a piece of evidence, like a text. And so that's where forensic downloading of text messages, emails, things like that. Does uh, that authentication happen before this complaint goes out? No, it happens that at happens discovery. during the discovery process. Okay. You have to have experts and you have to have uh people to authenticate uh, this evidence, in, in particular electronic evidence. And authen authentication says that the thing is what you say the thing is. In other words, if it's a picture, it hasn't been doctored. If it's a text message that, you know, you have more than just a screenshot of it, preferably, preferably uh, Janelle Grant has still the text messages so that you can see not just a screenshot but that you can see when vince first started texting her hopefully she's got them all because that's superior in terms of evidence it's not to say that the screenshot of that you know couldn't uh be authenticated it would be better if she had her actual text messages emails well, I mean, at that point in discovery, they're going to be able to pull the entire conversation at that point, right? Sure, sure. And, and, they, probably, and they probably will. Right. So when right. they do, and when they do that, would a jury be able to see all that? Yes, absolutely. And, and you call the forensic evidence expert who lays the foundation for what he or she did in order to retrieve those messages and testifies under oath that, you know, I saw and that this text message was sent from this phone to this phone, you know, either on a message, uh, a, a message or an iMessage or something. And I mean, there's a whole science to this that has exploded since the internet and cell phones and smartphones and all of that. Some really, really smart people who know what they're doing and how to authenticate this stuff. So, so when they see all of those text messages from, because out of all the screenshots, we only seen one that, that you had called into question of like, Hey, if a juror, juror seen that they might not think that this was genuine. Yeah, her use of the word baby. So if, McMahon. if they open this up and they see a lot of positive 
context to some of these advances. Is that going to sway the, the jury in any way? It, it could potentially sway the jury if it seems like she was more of a willing participant. There, She and her lawyers are going to have to have a better explanation and her mental health experts a better explanation for why she would respond that way, uh, to be precise. So, uh, But if there are some from McMahon that are worse than what we've already seen, or there are some from the physical therapist, or there are some from Laurinaitis, or there are some from higher ups within WWE saying, keep your freaking mouth shut. You know, you're on a gravy train right now. Vince is taking care of you. Keep your mouth shut. Keep your head down. You know, uh, like reportedly there were some conversations with Ashley Mazzaro. You know, uh, you're you're along for the ride, kid. Vince, you, you rebuffed Vince last week. All right, you're along for the ride now. He's going to write your promos. He's going to sink your career, and uh, you know you're you're done for essentially. So, the the texts, the emails. Uh, the messages, you know, what whatever apps being used or whatever, it, it's going to be real interesting. And the funny thing is, uh, and this dovetails with the uh, <laughs> with the criminal case. The SEC opened an investigation in the summer of 22 about you know what was company funds being used to pay either Janelle Grant and or others. In the summer of 23, uh, the FBI raided McMahon's home. Big question in my mind is, do they have his cell phone? Have government investigators from the FBI or the Department of Justice downloaded, forensically downloaded Vince McMahon's cell phone? Because I'm telling you, just because you think that you've deleted a text, that text isn't gone. It's on your cell phone somewhere. Wow. So they very so, well could have that. Yes, they very well could have every single message that's been exchanged. Well, before and, before we finish this video with the criminal side of this, because I definitely want to get into where we can go criminally if this goes that way. What I would like to ask is if you are her lawyer and these text messages come out and you have all the text records here and you see that there are a lot of text messages that would lead you to believe that this woman was a willing participant in all of these activities. How would you go about defending her? I, I don't believe that. I don't believe they would have come out with such a strong complaint if that were the case. But this if it was on record of saying that, I don't believe that uh, they would have come out firing the way that they did sure. if that were the case i would and, agree with that and i i think probably that uh they probably have already seen all of her text messages you, you know that they probably you know having done a number of these cases before uh i've been there and what i have done in the past is i've taken my client's cell phone send it to a forensic expert get everything downloaded I will see every single thing on the phone long before I file a complaint like this. Wow. All right. So let's go to the criminal side of this before we finish up the video and see. All right. You know who I mean, obviously, Vince McMahon could very well face criminal charges on this situation. Um, John Laronitis could face criminal charges. I don't believe that Brock Lesnar can face criminal charges and out of just what we've read in the complaint, you know, if discovery pops the lid open on a bunch of crazy Brock stuff, then it is what it is. But right now, from what we know, I don't think Brock could see any criminal situation from this, but you know what? I'm not a fucking lawyer. You are. Well, here's the thing. It, almost every state has uh, laws on the books that uh, prohibit the soliciting of sexual photographs, which means that every dick pic sent, every naked picture between consenting adults, I might add, uh, all of that might technically be a violation of some obscenity law or some something. 
But think about if the federal government were out trying to chase down everybody that has asked for a picture of boobs or for a picture of someone's butt or had just had a young lady's cell phone number and sent an unsolicited dick pic. The federal government doesn't have enough time to send to chase down all of that, even if it technically violates federal and state law. It would have to be much more pervasive than that. But that's that's kind of the low hanging fruit here. Uh, the the big stuff that we're talking about uh, is the stuff that the SEC has been investigating for. Uh, a year and a half going on two years, uh, which is the failure to disclose this to shareholders, uh, the using corporate funds to pay uh, for McMahon's sexual trysts or in satisfaction of NDAs. And then you get into the things like the sex trafficking or the conspiracy to commit those types of acts. That's where this really could uh, get some folks in trouble. And the question is, do you believe that the sex trafficking uh, claim is, uh, is valid wording? I, I do. I, uh, under, mm -hmm. under the federal law that was cited to, if Vince is telling Janelle Grant, go down to Manhattan and hook up with this guy, because I'm telling you, I want you to go to Manhattan and hook up with this guy. That absolutely meets the definition and the spirit of this federal law. Or uh, Laurinaitis flying in from Arizona to Connecticut for the purpose of engaging in the weekly scheduled sex acts that McMahon had lined up. It absolutely meets both the letter and the spirit of uh, this law. Well, I guess the layman, which would be myself when it comes to law, looks at trafficking like people stealing other people and selling them on the black market type of thing. And I guess this is just a different way that's still trafficking. Right. And I've used the example uh, in our first video of, you know, one college student lives across the river uh, in Ohio and another college student lives in Huntington, you know, Huntington, West Virginia, directly across the river from one another, but when when you An oddly get, specific story, Steve. Yes, oddly specific story, but uh, I, I wouldn't know. But uh, when you start to get the uh, pervasiveness into it of you know an external person uh, arranging this, you know, then that's where it starts to look. You know, nobody's trying to say that someone. Uh, bound and gagged someone, threw them in uh, a uh, trunk of a car and drove them somewhere for this to happen. Uh, but there is a, an element of coercion and control and things like that that I think that the government would need to have to make a charge like that stick. Now, uh, prosecutors like to prosecute. They also like to prosecute uh, cases that they've got a 95% chance or better of winning. And I, <laughs> the prosecutors are going to probably have to have some really rock solid evidence and believe in Janelle Grant in order to file criminal charges against uh, McMahon and or Laurinaitis. Now, the question becomes, does this become like a RICO or a mafia style deal where they pinch lower people to get their stories. They put a grand jury in place and then they tell someone, uh, this is completely hypothetical, let's say Kevin Dunn. And they tell Kevin Dunn, they, they issue him a subpoena. They tell him that he is the target of a federal investigation for conspiring to cover up uh, sex trafficking and other illegal acts. And you subpoena Kevin Dunn to a federal grand jury in Connecticut, and you see if he's going to sing, or you see what he knows. And in a lot of those types of situations, the federal government's trying to build up the chain to get to Laurinaitis and to McMahon, or it may be a situation where they need Laurinaitis in order to get to McMahon. So maybe they cut a deal even with him 
in order to flip on the big boss, the guy, the puppet master, who is coercing everybody trying to make all of this happen. And it's not uncommon to see people get immunity from criminal pr prosecution in order to uh, turn on the real target of the federal investigation. The fact that there was an SEC investigation going on already, though, gives the government a great leg up already on this, Brian. So in closing, I have two questions for you. The first question is simple. Is Vince McMahon going to serve Tom over this? In your opinion? Right, right now, I, I would say... I would say that the serving time is about at, at a 50-50. 50-50. 50-50. Okay. A, a flip of a coin. He has houdini himself out of everything that's ever come up, you know, the spa ordeals and the, you know, the whatever else. Is. He, he's been able to Houdini himself out of those type things. So I think sure you'd have to have a really aggressive prosecutor. Well, okay, so... That brings me to my second question. Has a billionaire ever served Tom? Uh, Bernie Madoff, I don't... Oh, was he a billionaire? I, I don't know. I'd have to look that up. But, uh, I don't think anyway, he was a billionaire. I'm just it, curious right. if, if a billionaire has ever served any Tom. We see, we see other billionaires out there in the world that totally uh, are the Teflon dons, no pun intended. Uh, that get out of anything Not a billionaire but yes well there's all types of billionaires out there that skate through a lot of legal situations and yes. i'm wondering if that's what we're going to see in real time here but with it being such a high profile spotlights on type of situation that's interesting it's very yes. interesting of what we're going to see i would put the odds of that at a 50 50 now on the civil case I, about, I, yeah she's about to be uh, very very wealthy I, I would think so. I, I, I would think so. Uh, and again, I'll repeat what I said from the first video. Pay her. Pay her and her lawyers a large sum of money. Put this under a release and settlement agreement that has confidentiality in it, non-disparagement and all of that, and make this go away. I would be shocked if there hadn't already been overtures for that to happen. Free legal advice from Stephen P. New, every wrestling fan's favorite attorney. Fuck you, smart Mark. Anyway, <laughs> we are here and we are gone because this is the end of the video, but make sure that you click subscribe. Make sure that you click the little bell so that you get the notifications. Share it with your friends. Make sure you come back here and join us because I guarantee you there's gonna be more information and it's gonna lead to a part three, Steve. Absolutely. Not just, I'm thinking in my mind, parts three, parts four, parts five, because everything that happens, more people are going to talk. You know, Bret Hart weighed in on this whole debacle uh, and how bothered he was, not because he says he has any personal firsthand knowledge about it, just that it bothered him, given his closeness with Vince once upon a time. The Ashley Massaro stuff, uh, has you know been raised back to the public forefront, and there's going to be more fallout from this. And folks, listeners, viewers, Brian and I, other members of the House of Kayfabe who have strong feelings on this stuff, we're going to be right here for you. And I'll be giving you the ten thousand foot legal view. I don't have any connection to this case. I don't have any clients involved at least as of yet. Some of them may get subpoenaed to a deposition. If they are, uh, you can uh, believe that I'll be there defending their interests. But anyway, there will be fallout yet to come, and there will be follow-up on the House Kayfabe, folks. What I can say is we have a pretty large cast here on the House of Kayfabe, larger than a lot of other podcasts, and you and I are the only ones that even want to touch this subject with a 10 foot pole so it'll be us on part three through infinity and you will get it right here on this channel so like i said click subscribe click the bell and make sure you're here right with us on the house of kayfabe